Uh, this is a news story that just came out a few hours ago, and it says that parasitic worms could hold key to anti-aging research suggests. Well, the reason this caught my eye is because I've been following this helminthic therapy kind of peripherally ever since I heard the story of Jasper Lawrence, who was this guy that um, had really bad asthma and allergies, and he gave himself hookworms to try to treat his own asthma. And, and he was pretty successful at it and started a, um, a, a kind of a company to give people hookworms through the mail, which is a totally different story. I might make a video about that, but um, this has been an interesting thing that I've been following peripherally ever since that story. And you'll have to forgive my uh, speech today. Uh, I bit my tongue, so it's a little bit sore. So I might sound a little funny. But anyway, this uh, article says that parasitic worms could hold the key to the fountain of youth, according to new research from University College London. Um, so anyway, I, I kind of briefly read this article and just went straight to finding the actual article that they're talking about. And this is the article, so, uh, and it has a very interesting title, Gross Ways to Live Long Parasitic Worms as Anti-Inflammaging Therapy. This anti-inflammaging is a term that I have not heard of before, um, but this, this is something that I guess there, people in this field are calling it an inflammaging. And as it turns out, this is a review article. It's not new research. Review articles are essentially when people look at um, the research in their field and kind of uh, put it together and 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 give a synopsis of uh, what the state of the uh, field is. So he says we're going to read the entire article. We'll skip the abstract and go to introduction. The aging process is the main cause of senescent multimorbidity, the co-occurrence of multiple chronic pathologies that includes the major diseases of late life. The geroscience approach views Preventative intervention in the aging process is a means to simultaneously preempt the development of multiple age-related diseases. How does aging cause senescent multimorbidity? While there are clearly multiple contributing factors, one determinant whose importance is becoming increasingly clear is inflammation, the state of systemic low-grade inflammation that increases with age, independent of attacks by infectious pathogens. Okay, what all that means is, as we get older, lots of bad things happen. One of the main, and they're saying, well, there's lots of reasons that those things happen, but in their opinion, one of the major things that happens as we age is this thing that they're calling inflammaging, which I think is like a a word they they made up by saying inflammation and aging. And it's the state, and what we know is as we get older, there is more inflammation, there's kind of low-grade inflammation. And so inflammation is a very important thing. Uh, we use inflammation to fight off infections and to repair damage from injury. But um, what you need is you need the inflammation to increase fight and deal with the thing and then go away. As we get older, you get this low-grade inflammation that doesn't go away and is not related to any kind of infection or injury. Such inflammation is a contributory factor in diverse age-related pathologies, including cardiovascular disease, dementia, cancer, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, osteoporosis, age-related macular degeneration, and perhaps even symptom severity during SARS-CoV-2. Okay, they have to add this in because this is like the hot topic in science these days. So one cause, cause of inflammation is gut dysbiosis, an imbalance in the composition of the intestinal microbiome. So they talk a little bit about the microbiome, and we know that the microbiome is extremely important for overall health. And uh, there was another a video that I made earlier, which I'll link below, talking about the role of the microbiome in SARS-CoV-2 as well. But what they mentioned, while the possible role of the microbiome in inflammation has engaged the imagination of biogerontologists, little consideration has been given to a possible similar role in the aging of the macrobiome, in particular, helminth parasites, which include flukes, tapeworms, and nematodes. Uh, so helminth is just the word meaning worms. So parasitic worms, which include flukes, tapeworms, and nematodes are roundworms. Parasitic helminths have infected humans throughout their evolutionary history. As a consequence, helminths have become master manipulators of our immune system in order to dodge host attack. Meanwhile, we have evolved some level of tolerance of their presence. The wisdom of sometimes putting up with helminths is illustrated by the pathologies that can result from overly aggressive anti-helminth responses as in elephantiasis that can result from in infection with the filarial nematode Wisteria bancrofti, Wistertia, or Wisteria bancrofti. 
Through such coevolution, normal human immune development and function is likely to have become dependent on the presence of immunomodulatory elements as well as that of their microbial counterparts. Indeed, like old friend microbes, reduced helmet infection in ultra-clean modern society has been linked to increased rates of allergic and autoimmune inflammatory disease. Okay, so what this is saying is that um, humans have been infected with parasitic worms uh, for as long as we know about throughout history. And um, the parasitic worms have to evade our immune system. So we have an immune system to try to get rid of the worms, and the worms have to have a way of trying to uh, escape our immune system. And one of the ways they do it is they probably um, m regulate our immune system and make it not so ag overly aggressive. And if we're overly aggressive about um, um, fighting off the worms, then they can cause its own set of problems, which is they're talking about the elephantiasis. And, and so this modern thing where most people in modern developed countries do not have parasitic worms, that's kind of a new thing in human history. That's only a thing that's been like, may, like that for maybe the past hundred years. For thousands and thousands of years before that, having parasitic worms was kind of the normal state of the human body. And so they're saying, maybe this is not usual and our immune system needs these parasitic worms in order to function normally. And by, the, by us not having the parasitic worms, our immune system is lacking a key regula regulation factor, which is the worms. And that's why we have uh, increased allergies and increased autoimmune disease in modern society. And then in this section, they go through um, various um, research papers that talked about how um, helmets are re related to like asthma, atopic eczema, inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and type 1 diabetes. So for example, a study from Argentina found that accidental acquisition of helmet infections not only caused a reduction in inflammatory cytokines, so getting infected with parasites reduced inflammation. Uh, inflammatory inflammation causing cytokines, but also alleviated symptoms in um, patients with multiple sclerosis. In a similar vein, studies from Uganda found that hookworm infections in pregnant women conferred protection against infantile atopic eczema. So atopic eczema is a pretty common thing that babies get. And it's in, in, in this study um, in Uganda, they found that if the mothers uh, got hookworms, the babies had less atopic eczema. Uh, more directly, a number of studies have documented beneficial effects of deliberate helmet infections, beginning with G, uh, J. E. Turton's 1976 report in The Lancet, which describes how maintaining an infection with the intestinal hookworm um, Nicator americanus alleviated his allergies. So The Lancet is a very well-respected journal, and in 1976, there was someone who purposely gave himself um, intestinal hookworms to treat his allergies, and it was successful. He did treat these allergies. And that is very similar to the story of Jasper Lawrence, which is a more recent story. And it's the first time I had heard of this helmet therapy. And so unsurprisingly, the use of live helmets to treat old friend disorders remained controversial. Giving oneself worms seems unwholesome to say the least. More seriously, there are obvious safety worries. Live helmet therapy may cause a resurgence of harmful infections in deworm countries or induce harmful side effects. So obviously, you don't really want parasitic worms. They, they cause their own set of problems. They, have, they cause diseases, parasitic diseases, which we don't really want. Um, however, these concerns may be assuaged by controlling dose size and using helmets with different definitive hosts, such as the pig whip worm, Trichuria cirrus, which is not reproduced in humans. So they're saying, well, maybe we can use worms that don't normally infect humans. That way their life cycle, the, the parasitic worms, their life cycle is very tuned to a specific host. And if you use like maybe a pig parasitic worm, it can't replicate in people, so you don't really get the diseases. However, they found out that that was not as effective as using actual parasitic worms that use humans as diseases as the host. Another strategy is to identify the mechanism by which helmets manipulate host immunity and apply those therapeutically. So then they talk about this glycoprotein ES62, which is secreted by um, this uh, rodent filarial nematode, and they've done a bunch of studies 
um, on this uh, protein showing that maybe this is the protein that the worm uses to regulate our immune system. And if we could just use the protein rather than the whole worm, that would be much more um, palatable as a treatment. Then this therapy, this section talks about inflammation can be detected as a sterile persistent elevation of pro-inflammatory molecules in the blood, including cytokines as interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and acute phase proteins such as C-reactive protein. Interestingly, reduced levels of circulating pro-inflammatory cytokines and CRP have been seen in people infected by uh, strongulid and filarial helmets in a number of studies. So they're saying when you get infected with uh, these um, and then, uh, these uh, helmets, these cytokines that are known to cause inflammation seem to go down. And in this section, they talk more about that ES62 glycoprotein. So that would be, if we could find something that did the same, had the same benefits of regulating our immune system and preventing us from having problems with autoimmune and other inflammatory diseases without giving ourselves an actual parasitic infection, that would be obviously really good. And so they're talking about that. There's also some very limited evidence that helmet therapy might promote resistance to some forms of cancer. We know that chronic inflammation can lead to cancer in um, some instances. So it makes sense that if you have something that decreases inflammation, it may decrease cancer rates as well. And then, um, like we talked about in the um, immunotherapy, Inflammation is kind of a double-edged sword in cancer. Sometimes inflammation causes cancer, and sometimes inflammation um, can rev up the immune system to fight off the cancer. So they have certain uh, parasitic helmets are known to increase cancer. So certain ones may decrease cancer risk, and certain ones may increase cancer risk, probably by modulating the immune system. So there's clear evidence that an absence of helm helmet infection leads to increased incidence of inflammatory disorders. So there is this, uh, there's a lot of lines of evidence that they talk about. Uh, population studies where we know that there's higher rates of autoimmune and inflammatory diseases now, um, which are related to less uh, parasitic infections. That's association um, and correlation, which does not necessarily mean causation. But then there's a lot of mechanistic studies where they show that um, giving people infections or um, treating the infections changes the uh, level of cytokines and uh, changes the rate of these uh, inflammatory diseases. So the evidence is like pretty good. Um, and so they, they need to do more interventional studies to kind of nail it down, which I think is what they're doing now with this ES62 and um, um, other interventional studies. The possibility of anti-aging helmet therapy raises various questions. How do responses to such therapy change with age? Would higher or lower uh, parasite or antigen levels be needed to take into account of immunosenescence? So this is uh, the fact that our immune system gets weaker with age. To what extent do risks of helmet therapy increase in old age? What are optimal ages to apply such therapy? Um, so a bunch of questions that they're wondering. And so effective application of helmet therapy require a clear understanding of specific um, anti-inflammation mechanisms. Theoretically, helmets could co counter inflammation in several ways. For example, they could inhibit sources of inflammation by preventing gut barrier permeability and obesity and neutralizing existing inflammation by increasing the proportion of anti-inflammatory to pro-inflammatory cytokines. Um, all right, so that's very interesting. Um, you know, basically, they, I think they understand that not too many people are going to sign up to give themselves parasitic worms to treat um, these diseases, although some might. And I think if it was actually pretty effective and um, it was a low dose and I had um, pretty severe uh, disease, I, I probably would sign up for it. Um, you can comment below if you if you would sign up to get parasitic worms put into you to um, treat some disease. Um, but I think for most people or a lot of people, uh, they will not be too keen on that. And if they could find a non-worm uh, method of giving you the benefits without the side effects, um, such as like that ES62 protein, uh, that'd be much more palatable to most people. 
but anyway, very interesting um, article. And I just I wanted to make this um, video mainly so I could just keep this link so that I could go back at some point and look at the original papers that they mentioned in this review article. Um, so thanks for watching. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, please put them below.